is unable to attend tonight's meeting, so as the vice chair, I will preside. Uh, first order of business is uh, a review and approval of the minutes from the prior meeting on December 21 of 2004. Are there any comments or suggested changes? Driven. I move that they be accepted as read. There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? The meeting minutes are approved. Uh, for correspondence that we have uh, before us tonight, we have a letter from uh, Dave Clay of 3 Misty Lane, <coughs> excuse me, regarding the zoning amendments. Uh, we have the report of the planning board activity for 2004, uh, the Shoreland Zoning News Fall 2004 edition. And we also have an email from Rainbow Construction dated January 18th of 2005 regarding uh, undersized lots. At this time, we need to have an election of our officers for the coming year. We normally caucus uh, this issue in the workshop uh, for the first meeting in 2004, but we didn't have a workshop, so we briefly caucused before tonight. Uh, do we have a... Uh, 2005. Please. Excuse me, 2005. <laughs> uh, do we have a uh, nomination for chair for the planning board for 2005? Barbara. I move that uh, Dave Sherman be the chair of the planning board for 2005. And a motion? Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, we also need to have a nomination for vice chair for 2005. I would move that Barbara Schenkel be vice chair for the year 2005. Okay, there's a motion second. and a second. All those in favor of Barbara Schenkel serving as vice chair for 2005? It is unanimous. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, uh, the first item on our agenda tonight is a consent <laughs> agenda item for the Nelson Private Access Way Amendment. Uh, Dr. Ra Robert and Janet Nelson would like to amend the previously granted private access way for a lot located at 2 Ann Arbor Drive to add a definition for the building envelope that allows the placement of accessory structures outside the building envelope, uh, section 19-7-9 private access ways. Uh, if any member of the board believes we need a substantive discussion of this item, then we would have to move it off the consent agenda Otherwise, if no one is of that opinion, I'd be ready for a motion. Yes, David. I just have one question. Uh, has there been any correspondence at all, any phone calls? We received uh, one piece of correspondence from the reels that you got as part of the workshop. We haven't received any additional correspondence or any phone calls. Thank you. I'm sorry. That correspondence wasn't on this project. No, we've received nothing on this. Okay, fine. Is there a motion? David? Make a motion. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dr. Robert and Janet Nelson for an amendment to the private access way permit granted for 2 Ann Harbor Drive to add a definition of activities allowed inside and outside the building envelope be approved as a consent agenda item. Do you have a motion? And it's been seconded. All, seconded. All those in favor? Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Under old business, uh, the next item on the agenda is the Grover Road Subdivision Amendments and Private Access Way Permit. Uh, Skip and Steve Murray are requesting amendments to the previously approved Grover Road Subdivision to reconfigure existing lots build a public road and construct a private access way for lot one, all located at the end of Grover Road. Uh, the application has been deemed complete and a public hearing was scheduled for this evening. Uh, the application will be reviewed for compliance with section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivision plans and section 17-7-9 private access ways. I see we have, uh, yes, David. Uh, could I ask? Uh to be recused from this as a family member is involved with the design? Certainly. See, we have uh, John Mitchell here tonight on behalf of the applicant. I ask John to give us an update on the project. Thank you. John Mitchell, Mitchell & Associates. <coughs> I represent, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 
uh, Skip and Steve Murray, uh, who are both here this evening. Um, as the chairman said, uh, this application is for an amendment to a previously approved subdivision and a private access way for lot 11. Uh, just to recap um, some of the existing conditions, uh, the property, which is a 1.7 acre parcel of land, is located between uh, Fowler Road and Grover Road. This is the, the shop end in Grover Road. <clears throat> uh, it's surrounded by uh, single family lots. Uh, the gravel pit is located just to the north of the property. Uh, the site generally flows in a northerly direction. Uh, the drainage, uh, there's a, a small grass drainage swale that originates from a culvert on the Fall Road. Um, at this point here, flows across the property uh, onto the gravel pit and uh, continues <coughs> um, down to the Spillwick River. This is the, uh, what I've outlined in red is uh, what is, has been previously approved for Grover Acres. There's a 48, a 40 foot wide right of way uh, that extends up to Fowler Road from the end of Grover Road. Um, and there are three, or five, I'm sorry, five approved single family lots. The proposal, <coughs> consists of the extension of Grover Road, uh, 444 feet from the end of Grover Road uh, to this point here, terminating with a, a hammerhead uh, turnaround. This portion of the hammerhead turnaround is the portion that is the private access way for lot 11. And the reason for this is to, um, is to provide the required 125 feet of road frontage for lot 11. Other than this, configure, this change in the configuration of, um, of these two lots, they remain the, as previously approved. The three lots on the easterly side of Grover Road uh, have been reconfigured to, to show two lots. The the roadway is being designed as a, uh, as a public uh, road. We have curbing on both sides. Uh, the road is 22 feet wide, and as I mentioned, a hammerhead uh, in accordance with the town standards. <coughs> Utilities uh, to the property, there's an existing eight inch main in Grover Road. We're gonna uh, tap off of that to this point where we're providing a fire hydrant and then there'll be a four inch line which will service the four lots. Uh, septic systems uh, will be accomplished with on-site disposal systems. Al Frick uh, has done the required test pit uh, for each of the four lots and the HH200 forms are in your packet for each of the lots. Electric telephone and cable uh, will be underground. Uh, will extend from an existing utility pole here um, and go underground. There'll be uh, probably one transformer located here which will service each of the four lots. <coughs> we have provided uh, street tree plantings in accordance with the ordinance, uh, two per lot. Uh, these are proposed as red maples, um, uh, evenly spaced out on either side of the roadway. The storm drainage uh, for this <coughs> subdivision is a closed system. We have a, a total of four catch basins um, within the road area, uh, all connected with a storm drain pipe, which will discharge at this point here, which is actually on the abutters property. And we're um, in the process of getting a signed drainage easement uh, from Mr. Wilmot. But this, this location here is is the lowest point um, in the area, and this, there'll be a 15-inch storm drain discharging into the low wet area, which will then continue 
uh, through the gravel pit and onto the Spermic River. Uh, <clears throat> there are four waivers that, uh, that we're requesting, uh, as we've outlined in, in our <clears throat> application. The first is a sidewalk along Grover Road. Uh, basically, uh, there is no sidewalk along the existing Grover Road. We're requesting a waiver of a sidewalk on the new portion of Grover Road. And as an alternative to that, we're proposing to uh, create a, a pathway which would, would extend from the end of the new portion of Grover Road up to Fowler Road. The second waiver uh, has to do with the side slopes. Uh, we're asking for a reduction from 3 to 1 to 2 to 1 side slopes in a uh, localized area. It's right in this area here, because of the 40-foot wide right-of-way, um, and because of the restriction in the grading um, in this area here of the roadway, we're faced with putting in a two-to-one side slope. Uh, this was reviewed by Steve Harding, and uh, he agreed with our, our uh, request. The stormwater detention, uh, we're requesting a, a waiver on detention basin, um, as I said, we're getting an easement from Mr. Wilmot, um, and also, in addition to that, there are no downstream impacts um, as it flows onto the gravel pit, and then from the gravel pit it flows onto town overland, uh, which is all part of the Spurlink uh, estuary. And the last waiver is uh, the road maintenance agreement, uh, because this is a public road. Um, there won't be a need for a road maintenance agreement. And lastly, uh, we received a number of comments from, uh, from both Maureen and Steve Hardy, and uh, we basically have addressed all of those comments. We're, we're going to be, those will all be uh, addressed in our next submission. However, because we didn't get the signed easements in time for uh, this submission, we're asking that this item be tabled until the, the following month. Okay, thank you. Thank you. A, a public hearing was noticed and advertised for tonight, correct? So our normal procedure is to move forward and have the public hearing, but I assume after that is concluded, we'll have a discussion about tabling the application. Okay, so at this point, if anybody would like to make a, a comment on the on the uh, Grover Road subdivision. Uh, Please come forward to the podium, introduce yourself, and give your street address, and we'll be happy to hear from you. The public hearing is now open. Okay, I don't see anybody coming to the podium, so I will uh, conclude the public hearing. Uh, there was a request here made by the applicant to table this until the next uh, hearing. Does the board first want to have any further discussion regarding the project? If, if there are any issues that the board has, it might be good to do that now since they're in the process of revising the plans. That wouldn't preclude you from bringing up issues next month. But. Yes, Paul. Question for Mr. Mitchell. Um, actually, two questions. First, uh, the additional catchphrase requested by the public sports director, could you point out the area where that is? And secondly, I guess a question for, to Maureen would be, um, what is the process for the town accepting this as a public road? John, I'll go first. Uh, one of uh, Steve comments, Steve Harding's comments was, um, and this was a result of a site visit <coughs> with uh, the public works director, Bob Malley, that they suggested that we put a catch basin in this location here to capture the small amount of uh, additional runoff, uh, basically our high point, we've created a high point here, um, and we've got a small amount of increase in runoff, and uh, so they made, the, they made the suggestion of placing a catch basin here. On January 11th, uh, last week, we met staff, um, Bob Malley, 
colleague Maureen, Steve Hardy, myself, and Skip, met out on the site to review the existing conditions and to review the suggestion of the proposed catch basin. Basically, it was decided not to put the catch basin there, that the increase in flow was insignificant <coughs> and that it would have, if, had we put a catch basin here, there, there, were, there were basically two <coughs> options for discharging the water. One was across Mr. Wilmot's <coughs> property and the other one was to uh, go down Skip's driveway uh, there was no room to go beside it. Had to go down the middle of the driveway, which meant tearing up the driveway and repairing it. So it was it was pretty much agreed that we didn't need the catch basin. Uh, there were a couple of other recommendations that Steve Potting asked for us to do, which we agreed to. Um, minor detail items. Um, so that's. Your, yes, what usually happens is that the planning board <laughs> review a project and uh, it's your responsibility to make sure that, that roads are built in accordance with town standards that uh, when you grant waivers they make sense and are reasonable and then after the, the project is built the applicant will apply to the council for acceptance of the road. Uh, prior to that acceptance the town engineer will go out there and verify that the road in fact has been constructed and in fact, he's out there regulating it just one time, mm -hmm. but they're, both he and the public works director go out during the subdivision construction to verify that the road is being constructed in accordance to the plans. In addition, at the end, the town engineer will verify, per, actually perform a, prepare a punch list for the manager that talks about how much is left of the road when uh, the applicant goes to the council, and then the council makes the decision of whether to accept it. Uh, we don't. Do we routinely see? No, use of those at, at that point? You never see those, no. The, the only thing that in major subdivisions, there's a two-step approval process. And between the preliminary approval of the planning board and the final approval, the applicant is required to go to the council for what they call conditional municipal approval. So the council actually gets a pass on it to look at, at the plan and they know something's coming. For small projects, amendments like this and things that are five plus or less, there's no going before the council first. It's basically that the planning board. Okay. John, I had a question on the requested waiver on the sidewalk. What's, what's the rationale for that? The rationale is that, first of all, there's no sidewalk on the existing Grover Road. So we'd be putting in a sidewalk that really wouldn't lead to, wouldn't connect up to a, another sidewalk. Um, and as an alternative in the end as recommended by staff we are putting, putting in this, uh, this pathway up to Fall Road. My understanding from Maureen's comment is that there, there I guess there are future plans for a sidewalk on Fall Road at some point in the near future and that, uh, that we would make a connection at that point. And is the Grover Road essentially like a, a, a horseshoe shape, the, the existing Grover Road plus the, the extent, extension? Yes, yes it is. Extends from Fowler Road here, the existing Grover Road ends here, and the new section would go to here. Okay. I would be inclined to go along with that waiver request, it, just as a preview coming attractions. I don't know if any other members of the board feel strongly about that issue. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions at this point? Okay, the applicant has requested that we table this. Do we have a motion? Barbara? Motion for the, excuse me, motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Leland and Steve Murray for amendments to the previously approved Grover Road subdivision to reconfigure the existing lot, build a public road, and construct a private access way for Lot 1, all located at the end of Grover Road, U20-7, be tabled to the February 15, 2005 meeting of the Planning Board. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? 
Jen. <clears throat> Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. Under new business tonight, uh, Thomas Higgins and Suzanne Conley Higgins are requesting a resource protection permit to cross a wetland with a driveway on a lot located west of 1084 Sawyer Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-8-3 resource protection permit standards. At this point, I would ask the applicant to introduce the project. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Albert Frick. I'm, in, I'm here on behalf of uh, Suzanne. Conley Higgins and Thomas, Thomas Higgins. Uh, the property owner is currently Alice Larea. The property is located at uh, 1084 Sawyer Road, uh, map R4, lot 49C. Uh, the, part, the proposed parcel is 84,152 square feet. It comes out of a larger 57 acre parcel that the uh, town acquired ownership from, uh, from Mrs. Larea. Mrs. Larea proposes to retain a parcel here of approximately 87,000 square feet and, and sell this parcel to the Higgins, which is currently under contract. In order to develop this parcel, the, the upland is in the rear westerly corner shown in this area and uh, in order to access the building site the applicants would need to cross a small area of RP2 wetlands. It's approximately 23 feet wide and 37 feet long the area of the impact 850 feet. That would allow them access to to reach the upland knoll and their proposal is to build a, an approximate uh, house size 28 by 40 feet with an attached two-car garage 24 by 24. Have a small turnaround and a proposed on-site septic system with uh, public water. They did look at the possibility, uh, spoke to Mrs. Uh, Larea, as opposed to getting an easement to, to come across this parcel around the small area of RP2 wetland to access this back upland area and, and that was not obtainable. So uh, this would be the option to access that back section. Thank that, you. That's basically a quick summary of it. But at this point we first have to deal with the issue of completeness. Uh, are there any comments or questions from the board on that issue? Do we have a motion? David. Motion. <clears throat> motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Thomas Higgins and Susan Conley Higgins for a resource protection permit to construct a driveway over wetland located in a lot west of 1084 Sawyer Road be deemed complete. Okay, David Griffin has made a motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Peter Hatem. Uh, all those in favor? The motion carries. Uh, at, at this point we need to decide if a site walk is in order and whether a public hearing will be scheduled. Are there any thoughts on those issues? 
Barbara. Well, I certainly think we should have a public hearing because there was one letter that I know of that was written, and, and I think that would be prudent. Okay. Any thoughts on whether we need a site walk? It doesn't appear to me that a site walk is necessary here, but if anybody disagrees, I'm happy to. No, I agree. I don't think we're going to see anything anyway right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of snow. Good point. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we'll set up for a public hearing. Maureen, when would this come up for public hearing then? Excuse me, February 15th. Okay. Do we have a motion? Peter? I move that the uh, above application be tabled to the regular February 15th, 2005 meeting, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Peter Hayden has made a motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Barbara. All those in favor? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Under other business tonight, uh, the town council forwarded to the planning board for consideration an amendment to the zoning ordinance that would reduce the RP1 wetland setback from 250 feet to 100 feet for properties in the BA district. A public hearing has been scheduled for this evening and the planning board will review the proposed amendments consistent with the provisions in section 19-10-3 amendments. Uh, we have considered this amendment at a workshop from a few, two workshops, thank you. Uh, and it appears from, actually Maureen, if you could just clarify for me sure. uh, the scope of this amendment and how, many, how much property this will affect that might be useful for people attending tonight. Uh, sure. The proposed amendment would only, would impact properties uh, in the Business A district and properties immediately adjacent to the Business A district and those properties would have to be adjacent to a wetland. We have two business aid districts in town. One is located on the northerly end of Shore Road, and there's no wetlands surrounding that business aid district, so it wouldn't impact that at all. There's another business aid district that's on the southern end of Route 77, uh, where it intersects with Two Lights Road. Uh, it includes the, the general store, uh, the good table, the agway. That business district does have a wetland to the west or to the rear of that business district. And this amendment would impact all of those properties. Um, it would also impact to the extent that it allows business A property owners to do something they wouldn't <coughs> otherwise be allowed to do, properties immediately adjacent to that business A district. Uh, what the amendment proposes to do is that under the current ordinance, um, an RP1 wetland has a mandatory 250 foot buffer but there are four existing ways to get that buffer reduced to 100 feet under the current ordinance. One way is that the buffer is uh, established from a, a, excuse me, a sand dune rather than actual wetland, in which case we automatically reduce it to 100 feet. A second way is if the wetland is less than two acres in size, so it would have to be at least an acre but less than two acres. We would also reduce it to 100 feet because a 250 foot buffer would end up creating a buffer larger than the actual wetland. Uh, the third way to do it is if you are in a densely developed area. If you choose to develop on a site, pick a location, and then measure out 250 feet and draw a circle around your site, and that circle includes or hits six main buildings, you're considered in a densely developed area and you can have the buffer reduced to 100 feet. And the fourth way is if your development site is topographically distinct from the wetland. That would mean that there is a drainage divide between you and the wetland so that your drainage, your site drains away from the wetland and doesn't end up in the wetland. Uh, none of those, um, actually let me correct myself, the proposed amendment would add a fifth criteria and that would be that if you're in the business aid district and you're connected to the public sewer and public water, you would be eligible for reducing your buffer from 250 feet to 100 feet. Um, some of the reasons that you may want to treat the business aid district a little differently from other districts is that 
there's very little land in the town zone business a and very little land in the town zone business at all and this would enable a more concentrated development of the existing business zone land in town um, obviously there are other options for re leaving at the 250 foot mandatory setback that we currently have. Are there any other questions? Okay, a public hearing has been scheduled for tonight. If anybody would like to speak on this proposed amendment, please come to the podium and introduce yourself and give your street address and we'd be happy to hear your comments. The public hearing is now open. It appears that no one is here tonight to speak regarding the BA wetlands amendment, so I will now close the public hearing. Okay, at this point, I'd invite any comments, further comments from the board. This has been the subject of two workshops and has been discussed at length by members of the board, but if anybody would like to add additional comments tonight. David? I have a couple of questions. I'm going to ask my first one now. Um, this memorandum that was sent to us by the Conservation Commission on the 12th, I was going to ask Maureen if, if this became public uh, knowledge around. Is it, is it was it publicized at all? Has anybody had a chance to read it? There was no, us? there was no unusual or unique efforts to publicize it. It was sent to the planning board, sent to the town council, and it was placed in the file that I have in my office, so anyone could look at it. Any other comments or questions? Barbara? I, I did have one person call me who is a resident of the Cape saying that he was concerned, although he's not here. I left him a message and said there was a public hearing tonight, so I'm not sure that's relevant. But we do have one other letter saying that they do not support um, someone who lives in the Cape, the change to reduce the 250 foot buffer to 100 feet. And I think that should be public and part of the record. Okay. David? Hey, I guess I probably are going to state my position on this issue, but I, I kind of have a couple of feelings in either direction. Um, I read with, with interest the memo from the Conservation Commission, and I think they make some viable comments. Um, and. I think that I heard Maureen say something about the fact that if anybody, dev if, if we were to allow this and the town council allowed it, that if anybody developed it, they'd have to make sure that the drainage went in the right direction. But I find it hard to um, not consider somebody's request to, to reduce this, especially in a business area where their next door neighbor is enjoying sitting right in the middle of the wetland and doing a lot of business. So. Uh, from that standpoint, I think I'd be in favor of recommending to the town council that they reduce it. It, it, uh, it allows them to utilize their property and not be under restrictions that somebody already has. So that's my position. If okay. we're voting tonight, that's the position I'm going to take. Thank you. Barbara? I have a question. <clears throat> the map that we have, and I, I wish we had a big blow of it above it so everyone could see. If somebody doesn't have it, I have a nice colored one that we got at the workshop, but it appears that at least one building is in the wetland right now. Is that correct, Maureen? I believe several, at least I believe there are more, there's more than one building that is either in the wetland or dramatically located within the 250 foot buffer. Um, the problem with the, the maps that you have is you have to look at the dotted lines that I drew in and the dotted lines. We only go Way. Right, because that's the only information I have. Okay. The, the only information that was provided that had um, physical in the field mapping of the wetland line is, that's the extent of that mapping. The rest of the mapping that I have is based on aerial county soils, aerial photography, soils mapping. And you know, we, we know that's not accurate enough at a parcel by parcel level. So we require um, on-site field determination of boundary lines. But 
that costs money and usually it's the burden on the applicant to provide that information. While I'm concerned that the Conservation Commission does not support this change, I also feel that we've got a violation of the regulation several times over from, from what you're saying as it stands now. That not happened before. Non but because of that and because of the limited amount of the A district that we have, I think I'd still be in support of sending it on to the council for their consideration. They can make some decisions. I, I echo the comments that have been made uh, by David and Barbara. Uh, does anybody else wish to comment before I echo we the comments as well? <clears throat> Do we have a motion for the board to consider? David. I'll make a motion. <clears throat> motion for the board to consider. He had ordered that based on the materials and facts presented, the planning board recommends the BA district wetlands amendment to the town council for adoption. Okay, motion has been made by David Griffin. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Jack Keneally. All those in favor? The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the last item under other business is uh, another proposed amendment to the zoning, zoning ordinance. Uh, the Town Council has forwarded to the Planning Board a request to consider reducing the minimum building lot size for non-conforming lots served by a public sewer. The Planning Board is considering reducing the minimum lot size from 10,000 square feet to 7,500 square feet if the lot is served by public sewer and complies with the mandatory affordable housing requirements. The draft amendments also include a reduced road frontage requirement for non-conforming lots. A public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The amendments will be reviewed or considered consistent with the provisions of section 19-10-3 amendments. Uh, again, this amendment has been considered by the board at public multiple, thank you, I was trying to remember how many uh, workshops. Uh, and my understanding is uh, that one of the reasons for this proposed ordinance was to allow for, for hopefully for more additional building of affordable housing within the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, Maureen, if you may, perhaps it might be useful for you to summarize how we got here and what this is intended to do. Sure. Um, I'm non-conforming lots are lots that um, exist prior to the current zoning. And at the time they were created, they were legal lots, but they don't comply with current requirements. And we have a separate set of setback and minimum lot sizes for those non-conforming lots. Our current ordinance says that even if you're in a, a 20,000 square foot or a two acre minimum lot size zone, if there is a lot that was recorded in a subdivision plan that has at least 10,000 square feet and you have to use the exact lot lines, well, you don't have to, you have to, you have to respect the original recorded lot lines. But if you have at least 10,000 square feet, you can develop those lots on either public sewer or septic. On the septic, there are some additional requirements that have to be met. But the bottom line is, if you can meet those additional requirements, you can develop those lots. Uh, the council has forwarded a request to the planning board to look at undersized lots. Um, they didn't set a number. They didn't give you a specific goal. They just asked you to look at it. But in the discussions the council had, one of the issues raised by the council was that some of these undersized lots might provide an opportunity to create affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, so the planning board looked at this, uh, narrowed their focus to lots between 7,500 square feet and 10,000 square feet. You didn't look at anything smaller than that. Um, considered the fact that they would be on public <coughs> sewer and uh, then decided that if, if there was a compelling reason to make these lots buildable where they are currently not buildable, then perhaps requiring that the affordable housing provisions that are already in the ordinance be applied to these lots would be a way to respect the original intent for making the lots buildable and at the same time making them buildable because there are clearly some opportunities, there are clearly some places where people are not going to like to see 
the minimum lot size reduced in, in some lots that are not currently buildable would then become buildable. Any questions? Thank you. Go ahead, Jeff. Do you have a, an estimate, Lorraine, as far as how many lots there actually are that fall into this category? <coughs> In uh, September of last year, the town manager um, asked me through the town council's request to look at the possibility of reducing the minimum buildable lot size and what the number of lots would be. Um, this is a little bit difficult to do because you can't just use the assessor's maps. The assessor's maps reflect ownership and they don't reflect all of the lots that have been recorded in subdivisions. So if someone owned two or more lots and they had owned them for a long time, it would be shown in the assessor's map as one lot, whereas under our ordinance, they could actually go back and, and break off one of those subdivision lots and develop it separately. Because of that, we needed to create a separate uh, data layer that we used our GIS system to create. That data layer was created in 1999. And so I went back to the 1999 data, so there's a little bit of dating of this data. It's not exact, um, but we looked at um, lots between 10,000 and 7,500 square feet and also 7,500 and 5,000 square feet. Um, I looked at the number of lots that appeared vacant, and again, you know, we're, we're using GIS layers. Um, there are some lots that might be vacant but still would not be buildable because the house that was built on the original lot may be too close to the lot line and you can't separate the lot off if you're going to make the original lot non-conforming as to setbacks. So there's, there, I mean, definitely there would need to be more specific review of each one of these lots. <coughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is this number is an estimate, it's not exact. But you take the vacant lots, we, seg we separated out any lots that were in wetlands based on our wetlands map, and we've already talked about the wetlands map accuracy. Took out all the lots that were not in uh, having access to public sewer, and then we took out any other lots that we knew for other reasons were not buildable. Say, for example, there was a conservation easement on the lot. It looks like our estimate is that lots between 10,000 and 7,500 square feet, there are approximately 41 lots. Maureen, are those lots located in one area of town in particular, or are they spread out all over town? Um, I did do some aerial maps, and I would say that the lots are predominantly located in the northern part of town, in the neighborhoods we talk about as Oakhurst, um, but um, Oakhurst also on the other side of Shore Road. Um, there's also some lots located on Route 77, just south of Mitchell Road. And we probably have a few other lots in a few other parts of town, but that's where the predominant location of the lot. Barbara? This isn't my question. This was Jack's excellent question put to Maureen um, via email. but. How, how are the sales of the affordable houses in subdivisions where builders are required to have affordable housing? Is there a waiting list? How are they selling? Are they all gone? What is the need that is apparent to you? Um, the way the current affordable housing provisions are set up, the intent was to, one of the intents was to minimize the town's administrative burden in managing the affordable housing. Uh, so there's very little involvement in the town, and, and I need to give you this preface so that you know how good my information is. I mean, we regulate the income of the buyer, uh, the, the, the cost that you can sell the house for, and the property owner needs to, when the property exchanges hands, 
show us that the property owner, the new property owner, meets the income guidelines, and that when we get the titles, which we get anyway because we collect them for assessing purposes, we also look to make sure that the deed writer has been incorporated into the deed that makes it permanently affordable. Uh, so I don't really, I don't keep a list of affordable housing uh, needs in town. But what I do know is that I get calls all the time from from lots of different people. I get calls from single parents and from families and from older couples and from single people and children of people who already live in town. And what I do is I send them to the developers who I know still have lots available. My assumption is that those developers are keeping waiting lists and when their one or two or five units become available, they work off of their waiting list to find people who are um, to meet our requirements for income and then they basically can choose which one of those people they want to sell the property to. So I get a lot more calls than the number of units available. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Barbara. And I think for public knowledge, Maureen, could you please, so people can understand, um, there are two categories. One is low income and one is moderate income. What those homes, the maximum amount they could sell for? In our ordinance, we define low income as between 80 to 50 to 80 percent of the median income for the Portland area. Um, moderate income is 80 to 150 percent of the median income for the Portland area. We don't put the actual number in the ordinance because it would be outdated as soon as we adopted it. We reference those, those, those ranges and then we go to the state, usually Maine State Housing Authority, every year and ask them to calculate what the price ranges would be for that. Uh, what I have here are my most current, my most current information, which is, uh, I guess it's end of the year 2003, uh, low income would result in affordable house selling price of $134,773. Moderate income would result in an affordable selling price of $252,699. I can give you the income ranges if you want. Moderate income would be someone making up to $87,750. Low income would be, up to 80% would be $46,800. Yes, Paul. Maureen, not knowing, again, where these lots are, but if there were multiple lots within a established development, could this potentially create a problem with, could there be an issue with somebody coming and saying, You've got too many of these lots asking to be meeting the affordable housing provisions within a, within a development? Uh, the map that I've generated that shows the locations of these lots doesn't show any cluster of more than two or three okay. in any one place. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, a public hearing has been scheduled tonight on the undersized lots amendment, so at this point I will open it up to a public hearing. If you have any comments or would like to speak to this amendment, please come to the podium, introduce yourself, and give your address. Thank you. Good evening. Joe McHugh, 255 Mitchell Road, Cape Elizabeth. My wife and I have been living at 255 Mitchell Road for, oh, 16, 18 years now. We love Cape Elizabeth, of course. That's why we're still here. We don't feel that we're an elitist. We realize that there is an affordable housing problem not only in Cape Elizabeth, but throughout the southern part of Maine. I have an extensive experience in mortgage banking, so I may have a little bit more of a insight into it than the average person. Oh, there's a lot of factors going on here, I think, that it will drive this ultimately. Not the least of which will be the market factors that might, if these lots, by the way, I should point out, that I would be a potential beneficiary were the lot size reduced. There's a side lot on my house, a part of uh, going back years and years to a development that was uh, put in place somewhere around 1910, I believe, called Mantor, Mantor Heights along Mitchell Road. My uh, home is built on three lots. One of those lots way back was a summer cottage that still has an existence 
stone foundation there, now disguised as a stone wall. Uh, I'm sure that I could make an argument that that was a pre-existing structure, blah, 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 and could be spun off as an additional property. I would not want to do that. I would not want to do that to the town. I would not want to do that to my neighbors. There is, a, again, we get into a lot of different reasons. The area, and I am near the intersection of Oakhurst on Mitchell, the area has been backfilled quite a bit since I've been there the last 15, 16 years. The character has changed from very rural, now I guess we could call it comfortably suburban. Affordable housing does come at a price. It comes to everyone who precedes the affordable housing. I bought my home and chose to live in Cape Elizabeth because of my perception of what was affordable housing to me at that time and the quality of life that was available to me. Also knowing and investigating at that time the zoning regulations in place in Cape Elizabeth, I felt that I was making a secure investment in my future and in the equity that I would be building up in the home over the years. I wasn't buying the home to flip it. It was my home, not an investment. But in this time of life, we all have to be cognizant of what our real estate values are. We also have to be aware of what the taxes that we are paying. I submit that allowing smaller lots and allowing backfilling is going to put more pressure on our municipal services. The type of individual that's probably going to be looking at these houses are probably going to be, for the most part, younger people. There's going to be a lot of grandmothers. We're getting at the age where we're thinking about downsizing. So again, this might uh, even, I might be cutting my nose off to spite my face because we have a large home, probably a little too big for us now. But generally, you are going to have people with school-aged children. God knows we have enough problem as it is managing our school budget. The other things that really concern me, though, I feel that once th these lots come on the open market, the price, is, the price of a building lot is not, to my knowledge, and I'm not a real estate appraiser, is not really driven by the size of the lot. It's driven by the existence of that building lot in Cape Elizabeth. Cape Elizabeth building lots at a premium. Those lots will perhaps place such a burden on these potential homeowners that it's either going to suffer the quality of their lives by maxing them out on the purchase cost in the underlying mortgage, or perhaps by minimizing the quality of the construction and or landscaping of that property. In either case, the existence of replacing a woodland with a smaller home, I feel is going to be derogatory to the quality of life in my neighborhood where this to occur there. Another thing to look at too is the appraisal driven market approach for the value and I'm going to be selfish for a moment and talk about my home. When a person gets an appraisal, whether it be to sell the home, to refinance, or to purchase it, the most recent comps are considered comparable sales of a home in your neighborhood. If that home, instead of being a sizable purchase or sale, is now a more affordable home, that's going to drive the average down. And it's going to negatively impact the value of my home. Yes, I realize that this is me first, but <coughs> at some point you do have to have that as consideration. I do want you to very seriously consider this. I believe there's a lot of implications here. That the quality of life is something I think that we all love in Cape Elizabeth, and the quality of life in the northern part of town is being stressed, in my opinion, by the backfilling of many of these smaller sites. And I, in my opinion, it's marginal sites that have been built on within the last five years. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak on the undersized lots amendment? Sir? 
evening. Jeffrey Armstrong, 18 Avon Road at the Shore Acres. And I would like to uh, speak against the proposed amendment. I think it would really uh, change the existing makeup of our current neighborhoods, especially up where we are. In Shore Acres, there's a lot of, I use that term a lot, a fair amount of uh, uh, paper, uh, some, several paper streets with some uh, small, smaller lots and some lots that uh, have been joined together and could be subdivided and broken down to uh, even smaller lots. And I think that uh, basically if people uh, have bought property recently, let's say in the past 20 years, they've been under the, uh, they bought that, those lots with the idea that the, the surrounding lots, the surrounding land would be as it is. If, if there was an existing lot there that was met current uh, uh, zoning, requirements that could be built on, they, they would understand that when they bought their house, but if they bought their house and now realize that um, all of a sudden, uh, through a change in, in the ordinance, the south and land surrounding them but all of a sudden become two house lots, I think it's going to be unfair to the, to the, to the, uh, to the people, the neighbors. And I don't, I don't think it's going to be that unfair uh, to, to the existing land owner if they are told that they can, cannot all of a sudden break off a small part of their uh, current lot if it was pre-existing. I don't think it's going to be a real, it, they may feel it uh, economically, but I don't think they planned on that when they bought the lot originally. Um, again, uh, up in my neighborhood, there's uh, quite a few, some lots might even be able to be broken down to three lots if they were pre-existing. Some of these uh, subdivisions had very small lots, 9,000, 8,000 square foot lots. Uh, some of the maps I've seen of Shore Acres had very small, I think they might have even been set up for tenting or something, but these things were done back in the turn of the century. Um, and I don't know, I didn't hear you mention anything about Shore Acres. Uh, are there any? Should, would, would you like her to sure. find that out, sir? Well, yeah, I was looking at that, I was thinking, gee, why isn't Shore Acres on here? I think most of the lots in Shore Acres are already buildable under the 10,000 square foot non-conforming lot provisions. If they're under 10. No, but most of the, I think most of the most of undeveloped have. lots are at the 10,000 square foot range. And I think that's why they're not really popping up here because they're already eligible to be constructed on. Okay, the, the, what I wanted, wanted to mention was that if you had, some of those lots have been joined together. So let's say you have a 21,000 square foot build, current buildable lot on Paper Street, which again would be buildable if they wanted to figure out how to do it. All of a sudden you got two lots. Right? I mean, in other words, unless somebody looks back uh, a ways on these, on these deeds, you, you, you could say you have 41 lots, but you may have, yeah. you may have 82. I mean, you're right, this, and you're, you're right. It, it was a tremendous amount of work to go back yeah. to the original plans, and that's what we did in 1999 when we created that coverage. And you're right, Sure Acres is chock full of those extra lots. Yeah, in I mean, there. we'd have basically. But, but this analysis took that into consideration. So we looked at you know, every lot that looks like it's one lot. In fact, we, we, we uncovered all those invisible subdivision lines. You wouldn't be able to create a new lot. You would only be able to use those existing recorded subdivision lots. So right now, if you have three lots stretched together, and I, I know of many lots where exactly that's what's going on. Any one that's 10,000 or more old in, in size right. originally would be buildable now. Right. If you had three lots and two of them were 10, 10, 12, and 9, the 9,000 square foot wouldn't be buildable now, but this amendment would allow it. But I don't think Shore Acres is popping up as a major concentration under this amendment because they're already there. They're already there. Yeah. Uh, well, but there, there probably is some, mostly. yeah. Mostly. Yeah. But, but I think your sentiments probably would apply to other neighborhoods as well. So we can certainly appreciate right, right. And, your, your and, comments. And, okay, and I just wanted to mention too, I mean, I think if, if, if uh, it sounds like perhaps the uh, town council uh, is maybe coming from the right place, their hearts in the right place and kind of create some lots for affordable housing. But I don't think this is the, the way to do it. I mean, I think if you're going to do some, create some affordable housing, I think you're going to sit down and do a study, try to figure out where it can go. And, 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 and have a plan. And this is just like sort of a shotgun approach. Oh, this sounds like a great idea. Uh, let's pump out uh, 40 affordable lots. And it, it, it's an approach, but I, I don't have to agree with it. Also, I, 
uh, maybe Maureen could uh, mention this, if you were to create an ordinance, how would you control the pr price of a house once the, it, it, I, I'm assuming that Sony went in and had a, a, a 9,000 square foot lot, and it would be, a, I, I'm thinking that it would be allowed to be used as an afford, to build affordable housing. That sort of would be the gist of what they're trying to, they're trying to create. I'm happy to have a little yeah. bit of give and take if you if you don't mind. We, we would regulate it exactly the way we do it now with new subdivision lots where um, if you want to build on the lot, you need to get a building permit. And when you come in to get the building permit, you have to demonstrate <coughs> that you have put the deed restriction on the lot that says it's going to be permanently affordable. And that deed restriction also says that if someone wants to resell it in the future, they also have to resell it to someone who's in the low in or mo low or moderate income range for the lower or moderate income price. So we have actually have a system in place so we can control that. And because we get all the deeds in our office anyway to keep our assessing records in place, we're able to monitor that. We have monitored that for, uh, let's see, six lots so far. So that, that locks in the, 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 the increasing value. Right, so the value can increase but it increases as incomes in the region increases right. rather than based on the market rate increase. Okay, and that's permanent, can they, and there's no way they can get out of that theory. They record the deed, they have to, yeah. Okay. Okay, I guess that's how, again, I'm against it, and I think it's going to be done, it needs to be done in a planned fashion. <laughs> Thank you. David, um, <clears throat> Maureen, maybe you could clarify one point that he brought up beginning of his thing, and that is he was concerned about the subdivision of existing lots to create new yeah. lots. Well, why don't we finish the public hearing first, and then we can have further discussion of the proposed amendment. Would anybody else like to speak to the underside lots amendment? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Paul Bos, live at 4 Shaw Farm Road. Um, I uh, am a proponent of high-density development, and I'm in the business of uh, building houses. I think that, um, well, I'm really pleased with what happened with the Jordan's Farm uh, purchase, you know, the development rights. We live in a town where, um, at least I think many people, I do, uh, value farming heritage of the town and how beautiful it is to look at what that is. And I'm really glad that didn't go into uh, two acre lots, which is what would be required, I think, in that. So I think it's an RA zone. I'm, I'm not certain of that, but I believe that's what that zone is. But I'm really glad it's not going to become housing. And I think in our established neighborhood, that's a great place to put housing. But I think also it's really important to be respectful of people who are already living there. Uh, zoning ordinances change with the times and with the needs of communities. And um, that's, I guess, why we have public hearings and put things in our local newspaper so we're aware of it and respond to it. Um, so I, I, I understand that change comes and that zoning ordinances change and that when you buy something it may not be the way you think you bought it, the way you did buy it 20 years from now. Something might change, so stay informed. Also though I feel that if I bought a home and its value was at a certain level, um, which I think many people in this town have done and do, that it's an awkward fit to construct a home next door to them for 130000 to 230000 I think that's the range that I heard tonight from the 2003 uh, demographics. If somebody has a $500,000 house and you build a $130,000 house next door to them, I'm not sure you're doing the right thing by that person who lived there already. Um, there is a real strong need for affordable housing and 
and I think it's important that it gets addressed, and I'm, I don't have answers for it, but I'm, I'm not certain that the way to address it is to put 45 or so of them in neighborhoods where you could hurt people who are here already. Um, I'm also a real estate broker. Um, I have been for 25 years, and I'm aware of how appraisals work, and the property next door has a large impact on what the value of your home is. Um, but I, I don't advocate turning your back on affordable housing at all either. Um, I think it's critically needed and has to be addressed and has to be solved. There are a lot of people who have grown up in this town who can't afford to come in and live here in the same town that their parents still live in. And that's, I, I want to say that's wrong, but I guess that's also, you know, you might have to say that's life, I, and I don't, I don't like it, but that's what it is. And I had one question, and that is, um, on the affordable housing, uh, I understand the developer's obligation, and I understand just from listening that there's a deed that's recorded and so on, but on subsequent sales of that property, if the market is soft or something like that, um, are they permitted to drop that affordable housing portion and sell to the open market if after a certain amount of time they cannot sell under the affordable housing guideline or is that with the property forever and ever? My understanding, there is a, a time limit factored in and I'm sure Marinke could give you the exact number of months or is it? I think it's 12 months but the town also has the option to step in and buy it for the affordable housing price. And, no. The phone calls I'm receiving, I'm not guessing that's going to be a problem. I was going to say, I'm not really worried about that too much. But that, no, that's a, a, a good issue. Yeah. Right. In other words, so. ultimately the, the town can step in, but it's... Or, or it can be dropped. Or it can be, you can go below. If, if, let's say, you put your house out there at the affordable range and you've had absolutely no takers. Mm. You come to the town, you say, fine, you buy it from me. The town says, no, we don't want to. Then you can get the affordable housing restrictions lifted off your property. You can sell it at a market rate. Right. So, so it could be just a for a while, and then if a lot of things have to change, obviously, but it could. It's something that could evaporate literally based on what the market is. It, but that, that's certainly true. In a perfect possible. World. Um, I, I support what you're proposing with the exclusion of making them affordable house lots. Uh, I think village setting development is really a good idea. I'm not sure if I agree with the affordable housing part of it. And just in first saying thanks for letting me speak here tonight, but I, I also, when I heard the proposal, I thought, wow, it's really interesting. But I wondered, I mean, is it actually legal to require all these to be affordable housing lots by reducing the minimum lot size, is it a permitted legal process to do that? Or is it more something that the town would wish to have and say, well, if we do this, we're going to put this on it, and then it would be potentially challenged? Just wondered if that had been addressed in any way. Um, thank you very much for letting me be here. Thank you. Would anybody else like to comment on the undersized lots amendment? Thank you. I'll now close the public hearing. At this point, I would open it up to the members of the board if there are any further discussion of the proposed amendment. Jack, and I had Maureen uh, relating to the, <clears throat> I guess it was uh, Jeff Armstrong's initial comments. Um, he was presuming that existing larger lots could be subdivided to create new lots less than 10,000 square feet. My understanding is that's not really. No, what, but it, it, it seems like it's a subdivision. There are about 200 subdivisions that have been recorded in the town of Cape Elizabeth. It's a lot of subdivisions. And what happened is that these subdivisions started to be recorded in the 1800s, actually. There was a large number of them in the early 1900s. And a lot of them were very small lots. And people may have purchased two or more lots, built their house in the center of one of the lots, and it's always been that way. Uh, but, and then subsequently we've had zoning that was enacted that established minimum lot sizes. 
what this does is it says that lots that have already been recorded in, in sit in the registry of the deeds that show building lot lines those lots can be pulled apart again into individual lots to be individually developed and you know I think Mr. Panansky, who was here several months ago on the private on his uh, paper street, his his house actually sits on, I think it was two lots, and the house is on one lot, and there's a separate lot that's over 10,000 square feet that is looks like it's one big house lot, but he could turn around tomorrow and sell the other lot, and a driver could go in and a new home could be constructed. It wouldn't be subdividing the land, the land has already been subdivided and it's being held in common ownership by a single owner. Did that answer your question? Yes. I, well, partially answers my question, but my, okay. if, someone, if someone had an existing 23,000 square foot lot and it was registered that way, they could not subdivide. No. If, if you have, you, there has to already be a subdivision plan on file in the registry. Right. If you own one 23,000 square foot lot, and you're in a two-acre zone, there's no way you can cut it in half because the minimum lot size in that zone is 80,000 square feet. You're already below the minimum. There's no way you can further subdivide it. Thank you. David. Please carry that step further, Maureen. <clears throat> is, is the potential lot within the zone in Cape that you might think of that could ultimately be subdivided into uh, 7,500 square foot lots? Is, uh, excuse me, is uh, there it, I don't understand the question. Is there a potentially areas in Cape Elizabeth in your mind that would, um, I should say, is there lots in Cape Elizabeth that could be potentially subdivided in areas where the subdivision could exist with 7,500 square foot homes? Well, yes, right right now, yes, if, you're in the RC, if you're in the RC district and yeah. you have I think you need uh, three acres minimum. You can, or <coughs> five acres, I think it's five acres. Um, you can create a brand new subdivision. Um, you can opt to use the open space zoning provisions as opposed to a traditional subdivision at 20,000 square feet. And if you use the open space zoning provisions, um, your minimum lot size is 7,500 square feet. Your average lot size requirement is 8,800 square feet. And you must set aside at least 40% of the gross area of the land as open space. This, does, this doesn't amend that. No, it doesn't touch it at all, but okay. I believe it answers Mr. Cooper's yeah. question. Yeah, it could potentially. Uh, we can create those size lots yeah. now under certain circumstances. But, yes. they, but if this provision goes ahead with the council, they wouldn't be restricted to be affordable. No. Uh, in that situation, actually, they have to have a certain percentage. First, a percentage of those subdivisions oh, does yes. have to be the affordable. Present one that's yeah. Yeah. under the current rules. Yeah. The current rules, yeah, not, be, not because of this no. change. No. Under the current rules, a percentage of any new subdivision, sure. more than five lots, has to have an affordable housing component. Jack, Maureen, how many how many lots have we currently built with affordable housing? Uh, right now, we have six lots with homes built and people living in them. We have another three lots that have been approved and are pending construction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the six are occupied. Um, mm -hmm. What's the demographic feel of the six? Um, let's see. We've got a uh, family who was who was already a resident of Cape Elizabeth in one. We have uh, a single town employee in one. We have a, a, a single parent family in one. We have two, I believe, that are empty nesters. And I'm blanking out on the fifth one. Oh. Maureen, the other half of the amendment uh, that talks about the reduced road frontage, is this sort of going hand in hand with, with the reduced lot size because many of these are only have a small road frontage? Is that why that's also being proposed? It's, yeah, that, that's proposed because it's, I have a list of, of amendments that we need to address at some point, and instead of giving you a big package, I look for things to tag them on to that make <laughs> sense. Okay. And I do believe that where you have um, non-conforming provisions that provide for different lot sizes, different setbacks, and then still require those same small lots to comply with the 125-foot road frontage requirement is not consistent with the intent of the non-conforming provisions. So what, what I'm doing is taking advantage of this 
to try to address what I consider to be an inconsistency <coughs> in the ordinance and create a separate road frontage requirement for all non-conforming lots. Okay. Thank you. Barbara. A couple of things. One is I feel the need to explain at least what I think most of the planning board members, what we talked about when we talked about this. And our concern that we have people living in this town or working in this town who cannot afford to live in this town. We have people who are becoming older, whose incomes are reduced, who would like to stay in Cape Elizabeth but may, may not be able to um, because they can no longer afford the taxes on their current home or uh, I guess if they have a current home without too much of a mortgage on it, they don't have too big a problem. But we have young families who would certainly like to live here who cannot live here because they cannot afford to live in this town. And maybe one of the things that we could consider, uh, because I'm listening to the other side and I'm certainly understanding what people are saying about why people move to Cape Elizabeth and we too love our homes and we love living in this community. It's a beautiful place to be. Um, but maybe we ought to talk about making, if we recommend this, saying moderately priced houses, although I'm hard pressed to think anybody would build a house for $130,000 in Cape Elizabeth on these. Maybe we would say moderate income housing, which isn't all that low. I mean, 257000 did you say, Maureen? Yes. $257,000 with an income of $87,000 as moderate income. There are a lot of people in this town that don't earn $87,000 might be a very rational way to go, but I'm trying to help the public understand what we said and what we thought our thinking process as we were looking at this. Thank but that's, Barbara, just so I understand, and the proposal is, we would leave that option under this proposal to the applicant. So meaning, that, I don't know why, why restrict them to the lower well, amount. If you're, th if you're thinking, not gonna, one. if you're not gonna do it anyway, they can elect the middle option, so to speak. That's true. Um, so I, I, I think that your concern would be addressed with the proposal that's on the table already. But I think people are worrying perhaps that somebody's going to come in and buy, build a $130,000 home on their 7,500 square foot plus lot when in fact they're probably not going to do that. Yeah, so it would be almost impossible to build it. The market incentive is the opposite and since they're you want to go to that highest point anyway. I, I, Which isn't to me, that's really all that low. There are homes in this community that sell for less than $250,000. Existing homes. A few. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anybody else have any comments? David? Yeah, I, I think I want to uh, um, make my comments known tonight. Um, I'm, I'm very much interested in seeing an opportunity for the town to infill and get some more revenue from some of the lots that are uh, smaller than 10,000 feet. So I think that I'm very happy to see the town um, moving in that direction. So I'm in favor of, the, of, of this amendment uh, or a request to consider reducing lots by the town council. I'm not in favor of making it mandatory that, uh, or making it uh, mandatory that anybody that builds on any of these lots uh, uh, have to uh, meet the affordable housing standard. Um, I might make one suggestion that, uh, um, that or back up here, I, I am going to vote for this amendment because I think it's important to go to the council and I think this, in listening to our, uh, <coughs> our uh, guest tonight speak on this issue, um, I think the town council is going to wrestle with this, and it's going to be a big, big item. So I'm, I'm in favor of uh, voting for this tonight, but I want to state that I am not in favor of the restrictions. And I think that one of the alternatives that could be made is uh, that the town could offer these landowners an opportunity to um, subsidize them if they chose. In other words, I would, I would rather see the owners of the property choose as to whether they want a restriction or not. And I think that's, I think that's freedom uh, or, or private ownership of property. And I, 
I'm not in favor of the town putting restrictions on private property. <coughs> But I, but I will vote for this um, because I feel that infill is important. I think it's our opportunity to address sprawl as a town, um, and I, which is a very important uh, thing, I think. And um, transportation costs are going up. The closer they can live to an inner city where job opportunities are, I think is an opportunity. It's an also an opportunity for the time to town to get some more revenue and a smaller house on a 7,500 square foot lot is, or is not going to have as many inhabitants as, as a two acre lot. So I think it's, it is going to put some burden on the school system, but not as much as uh, one would think if you had 20,000 square foot lots. So uh, that's the position I'm going to take. Even though I'm going to vote for it, I do not agree with affordable housing restriction. Barbara? <laughs> I'll respectfully disagree. I very much agree with the affordable housing restriction. I think we desperately need affordable housing in this town. And I know that we live in a community where the homes are far more than $252,000. But if there was a small lot in the area and somebody came in and built, and I don't think the town should subsidize anything that the private person does. Um, they can't build, people cannot build on these lots today anyway. The lots are useless to them. So this restriction is a lot less restrictive than saying you cannot build on the lot. Um, and if somebody came into our area and there was a lot that was 8,500 square feet and a home could go in for $250,000 and somebody could live in our beautiful area, I would be delighted to see them come along. Well, I would echo Barbara's comments. I don't think we're placing a restriction on these owners of the smaller lots because right now they can't be built on. So to allow them to build on a 7,500 square foot lot with the mandatory affordable housing requirement is actually adding to their rights rather than taking them away. So the only re way I would recommend that this uh, amendment uh, be adopted by the town council is to impose that requirement. And I am inclined to vote in favor of forwarding this onto the town council for consideration. One caveat I would make, though, is I am guessing a lot of people don't know that this might affect them. A lot of people in, say, the Oakhurst neighborhood may not understand that they are living uh, next door to a 7,500 square foot lot that could potentially be built upon. And I am wondering, other than publicizing the issue in the Cape Courier, if there's a way to get notice to these folks. I know when we had this issue come up a few years ago um, with minimum lot size requirements for non-conforming lots, we actually, didn't we actually have a published list of these lots? <laughs> if I recall, I was sitting on one of them myself. Um, uh, is there enough, for, and is that, or is that unduly burdensome or expensive, Maureen, to do that? That's a question. Yes, that's a question. <laughs> well, certainly we could, we have the we have the lots identified. I need to. The caveat is, it's not exact. Right. I mean, there are lots that we don't have listed that may be buildable because our wetlands mapping is inaccurate. There are lots that we're listing as buildable that may not be buildable because the the house on the abetting lot is actually closer to the lot line than we know. So it's it's a little variable. Given that, yes, we could send notices to all of those people if we were directed. However. I do, I have had this conversation with both the planning board and the town council mm. on various issues in the past couple of months. And while there is a desire to provide adequate notice, um, there's also a desire to conserve town expenditures. And uh, I've been instructed to follow the, the notice procedures that are in the ordinance. If, if the planning board or the council would like me to go beyond what is legally required from the ordinance, we certainly can do that. I, I certainly don't, would not be in favor of attempting individual notification because I think uh, you could never get it exact. And since you're not complying with anything, I don't think legally you've accomplished uh, anything other than a little more publicity, which I think, frankly, once this gets to the town council, I think is going to happen anyway. Um, I do want to, I don't want to cut off David. No, go ahead. I, I do want to echo all the comments that have been made. I'm certainly going to vote strongly in favor of what we've put together. Um, Frankly, it isn't perfect, but it's a start. I certainly am quite sensitive 
to the uh, issues that all the uh, people who have spoken have raised, and I hope they show up at the town council meeting to raise them as well. I I'm open to other ideas. I mean, I'm not, this is a start because this came to us as a proposal. We've perceived the affordable housing issue as something that we need to address for a while. We thought this was an a good and excellent opportunity to bring these issues together, and frankly, I I'm glad to, to move it on to um, the town council for, for some more open debate, um, because if there are other ideas uh, that might increase the affordable housing stock in town, um, and yet let the people who do own these lots have market rate lots, I, I would be in favor of that. It's just right now we have nothing else um, to go with, and that's why I'd like to um, um, recommend that we uh, move this on to the town council. We're not approving anything tonight, we're just making a recommendation to the council. And if anyone else has any comments, I'm, I'm ready to make a motion. The only added comment I would make is if you are a resident of the neighborhoods that the town planner has mentioned tonight, you really, it would behoove you to figure out if one of these lots is going to affect you because the last thing we want to do is have something go through the town council procedures, affect a, uh, a property owner, and then feeling like, gee, I didn't know about that. Uh, and I, I, well, they didn't get their say. Right, and I would assume that an article in the Cape Courier will be forthcoming and there's, uh, there have been two, and have the neighborhoods been identified? Okay, well, well, actually, sir, the, the public hearing is closed, so uh, hopefully the word will get out, and I am in favor of this amendment, but I, what I don't want is for my friends and neighbors in uh, other areas of town to feel like they, they didn't know what was going on. Um, anyway, at this point, unless there's further comment, is there a motion? No, I think the only thing that maybe we could suggest, Maureen, is rather than listing lot by lot, if an article can list areas that might be affected and if people want more information, they can call you. Sure. And we can say that it's not exact, but this is the best we can do. <laughs> I have a motion. Okay, Peter. Um, I, I move that based on the materials and the facts presented, that the planning board recommends that the undersized lots amendments to the town council for adoption Motion has been made by Peter Hayden. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jack Keneally. Any further discussion? All those in favor? The motion carries. <coughs> motion to adjourn. Uh, motion to adjourn has been made. Second. Second. Those in favor? Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.